Almeister killed at least 25 people. With teenage students or boys mainly. Boys. And uh, they've heard that we uh, have found human remains on the property here. The biggest news from Fox Auto Farm on this Wednesday came early. Positively, five uh, bodies out there. Uh, by the bones he found yesterday, uh, I believe he found about 75 bones. Saying that this case was disturbing would be an understatement. The killer in this video is a guy by the name of Herbert Baumeister, a business owner and family man hiding a dark secret. He would frequent the gay bar scene around Indianapolis luring young men in and is said to have ended the lives of around 23 other people. As Herbert's killing spree grew, his life would start unraveling at a fast pace. As his life unraveled and fell apart before him, Herbert would become more and more erratic with his behavior, drawing suspicion from those closest to him. This suspicion, along with one key witness, would lead to Baumeister's downfall. Hey guys, welcome to the Crime Historian channel, a channel where I plan to upload one to two times weekly all true crime related, so if that's something that interests you, you can hit the subscribe button below. I really appreciate it. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Herbert Baumeister was born April 7, 1947 to his father, who was also named Herbert, and his mother, Elizabeth Baumeister. He would be the oldest of four children. Herbert was said to be fairly normal as a young child, but everything changed when he started his adolescent years. Herbert would develop a keen interest in death, like become overly fascinated with death and would play with dead animals. There was even an instance where he put a dead crow on his teacher's desk. While we're on the topic of the teacher's desk, there was also a rumor going around that he urinated on that same teacher's desk. And as I get into his work history and adult years, that will become more believable. Also noticing changes in his behavior, his parents would take him in for a medical evaluation, the result of which was they found out he was schizophrenic and had multiple personality disorder. However, upon hearing this news, Herbert's parents didn't really do much after that. They didn't take him for any sort of medical treatment or anything like that. The same trends that were present within Herbert's adolescent school years would also be present in his middle and high school years as well, with his odd behavior pushing away any potential friendships he could have had. Despite this, he was able to maintain decent enough grades in order to graduate high school. After high school, Baumeister would attend Indiana University in 1965. However, after only one semester, he would drop out. However, things were not all bad for Herbert, as while attending college, he would meet Juliana Sater, who was a journalism teacher at high school, but also was a student at Indiana University. The pair began regularly dating and found out they shared a common dream, which was to run their own business. As a result of Herbert dropping out of college for the second time, Herbert father would pull some strings with a few friends he knew at the local newspaper and land Herbert a job at the Indianapolis Star. After being pressured by his father to return to school, in 1967, just two years after he dropped out the first time, Herbert would return to college, this time to pursue anatomy. However, just like the first time, he would quit after only one semester. At this job, since it was entry level, he was tasked with doing simple errands and running reports between reporters' desks. During this time, though, he got on the nerves of supervisors and colleagues by just constantly pestering for positive feedback. He would say, did I do this right? Did you like the way I did this? After almost every task, he would also obsessively try to fit in with other co-workers and try and make friends, but would ultimately fail at doing so. During this time, Herbert and Juliana were still dating, and in 1971, they would get married. In 1972, about six months into Juliana and Herbert's marriage, he would be committed to a mental institution at the behest of his father. It's ultimately unclear why this was done, but the most common reason that's speculated is that Herbert was very depressed around this time. Despite Herbert Herbert's struggles, Juliana and Herbert's marriage wouldn't falter though. Time marched on into 1974 where Baumeister would start a new job at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. This was another entry-level job which is important to note as Herbert would act as a superior to his peers. He would try to tell his fellow co-workers what to do, would just snap and yell at them. It was almost like a little child emulating what they thought a good supervisor looked like and sounded like. Only Baumeister obviously was not a child at this point. He was 27 or 28 years old behaving like this in the workplace. This caused his co-workers to view him as an extreme oddball that should be avoided at all costs. To top off this odd behavior in mid-1970, he would also send a Christmas card to all of his fellow co-workers depicting himself 
and a male friend in drag. With the time period in mind, co-workers did not find this very funny and it just added to the oddball behavior. Due to his erratic behavior and the drag Christmas card incident, people viewed him as a complete nutcase oddball and they also viewed him as a closeted homosexual. Regardless of this poor relationship with his peers, Baumeister would stay at this job a full 10 years until about 1985. It's during the stretch of working at the B&B that Juliana and Herbert would have three children, their daughter Marie in 1979, their son Eric in 1981, and another daughter Emily in 1984. In 1985, Herbert Baumeister was fired from his job at the B&B when he urinated on a letter that was addressed to then Indiana Governor Robert Orr. Another interesting thing of note is months before this incident, there was urine found on a supervisor's desk as if someone had gotten up there and peed on the desk. Knowing what we know from Herbert's past, this was more than likely him. After losing his job at the B&B, Herbert, unable to find meaningful work elsewhere, went to be a stay-at-home dad for a little bit, and Juliana, who was previously a stay-at-home mom, went back to work to support the family. Having all this newfound free time was ultimately not good for Herbert, as he would take up drinking daily and would cruise around the various gay bars in town, unbeknownst to Juliana. To add to these troubles, about six months later, he was charged with stealing a friend's vehicle and also charged with consumption conspiracy to commit theft. To coincide with Herbert's ever-increasing weird behavior and his brushes with the law, bodies started appearing as early as 1980 all the way up until 1991. There was about a dozen young men scattered along I-70 at various times throughout this year span. They would all appear partially nude or fully nude and would be strangled. To add to this, the last place these victims would be seen at were typically around gay bars in Indianapolis. The killer would become known as the I-70 Strangler, and while the identity of the I-70 Strangler remains uncertain to this day, many authorities and investigators actually point to her Baumeister. I'll explain this in more detail when it becomes relevant around 1991. Trouble in Herbert's life continued into 1986 with his father unfortunately passing away, although the effect this had on him is unclear. It's around this time that Herbert began work at a local thrift store, and while initially he felt that the work was beneath him, he sat and observed for a while, and he actually thought that this could be his new profitable business, so he began studying it deeper for about three years. In 1988, after obtaining a $4,000 loan from his mother, he and Juliana would start their first business, a local thrift shop that they would name Save-A-Lot. Like many other thrift stores, this place sold used furniture, used clothes, and other used goods. Business boomed very quickly, and he was even able to partner with a local children's charity. Business was so successful that only a few short years after opening their first one, they would actually open a second Save-A-Lot. By 1991, the Baumeister family was viewed as well-respected in the community due to their wealth as well as their charity work, contributing around $50,000 a year. Year. In 1991, thanks to their business ventures, the Baumeisters would move into their dream home, Fox Hollow Farms. It was a nice, almost mansion-like house that sat on 18 acres complete with a stable, an indoor pool, and many other lavish features. Remember those bodies being dumped along I-70 all the way up until 1991? Well, authorities speculate that Herbert acquiring Fox Hollow Farms is the reason for the bodies ceasing to be dumped along I-70, as with Fox Hollow Farms, Herbert had a full 18 acres to dispose of his victims. Whereas before obtaining Fox Hollow Farm, Herbert had a much smaller property that did not have room to hide victims. Another reason for the I-70 deaths being attributed to Herbert Baumeister is due to the MO. They were all strangled, the majority of the victims were young men, and the last place the majority of them were seen was at local gay bars, many of the gay bars which Herbert frequented. Although authorities strongly believe Herbert Baumeister to be the prime suspect for the majority of the I-70 killings, the case is officially unsolved. The victims of the I-70 Strangler were 15-year-old Michael Petrie, 23-year-old Maurice Taylor, 14-year-old Delvoid Lee Baker, 22-year-old Michael Andrew Riley, 17-year-old Eric Allen Rotger, 29-year-old Michael Allen Glenn, 21-year-old James Robbins, Stephen Elliott, age 26, Clay Boatman, 32, Thomas Clevenger, 19, Otto Becker, age 42, and John Paul Talbot. If there are some names in the newspaper on screen that I didn't mention, it's due to the police finding out that certain victims had two perpetrators, therefore those victims weren't directly tied to the I-70 Strangler. Once Herbert got settled in at Fox Hollow Farm, the disappearances of men around Indianapolis would start up again. During the times that Juliana and the kids would leave to go on summer vacations, or to just escape the weirdness of Herbert over the years in the early 90s, Herbert was out cruising Indianapolis and experiencing the nightlife at the various gay bars. It's 
it's here that he would prey on the young men at these bars. Murders after Herbert acquired Box Hollow Farm would typically follow a similar set of events each time. Herbert would go under the name Brian Smart and would pick up gay men to have sexual encounters with back at Fox Hollow. He would say that he was living there temporarily in order to do some landscaping work while the family who owns the house was gone. Once back at the Fox Hollow property, Herbert would tell his guests that he had a fetish for autoerotic asphyxiation and liked to be choked while he got off. Usually after some convincing, his guests would agree to try it. Once he finished, he would convince his guests that they should try it as well, only when he was doing the choking, he wouldn't stop until they were dead. In these strangulations, Baumeister used his hands, neckties, belts, and even a garden hose. He would then dispose of the bodies on his large 18-acre property. To dispose of the remains, he would bury them, throw them into a creek on the property, and he even tried burning some of the bones. Many of the bones were smashed and mixed with the rocky gravel around his property. Turning our attention back to Herbert's family and business life, the Baumeisters often argued over the business and how it should be ran. As a result, he would often scream and berate Juliana. Herbert would also treat Juliana as just a regular employee. These frequent arguments took a toll on their marriage, and the couple would separate temporarily a couple times over the next few years due to these arguments. These temporary separations were not only due to the business side of things, but Herbert was also acting more erratically in his personal life as well, just becoming more and more weird. Juliana mentally took note of this odd behavior as Herbert would stay behind at the stores very often and wouldn't be home until late, late into the night. Coinciding with this ever-increasing odd behavior from Herbert, the once maintained grounds of Fox Hollow Farm, the freshly cut grass, the weeds were always pulled, it was usually kept in pristine condition, but as his behavior got worse and worse, the property became overran with weeds, it became dirty and neglected. As if his behavior seemingly couldn't get any more odd, Herbert then began bringing a plethora of mannequins which he would set up by the poolside and wet bar area, which by the way was the only area he seemed to care about, as previously mentioned the rest of the house was becoming run down, dirty, neglected, the wet bar and pool area was kept pretty pristine, and the wet bar was stocked with alcohol. These mannequins were then dressed up in very expensive clothing and were set up as if they were having their very own mannequin pool party. They would be set up in scenarios around the wet bar as if they were talking to each other, just having a grand old time. Some of the mannequins would even be in the pool. Um, he would decorate the surrounding area with expensive furniture. Herbert's neglectful behavior toward Fox Hollow Farm would eventually spill into the Baumeister's thriving thrift business, and the once pristine stores would start to look filthy and neglected. As a result, customers wouldn't show up as much, and their once thriving thrift business would start to fail. The thrift business then, as a result, began to just hemorrhage money and the bills began to pile up, leading to Herbert drinking more and more and going out more and more at night. To escape the escalating weirdness, as well as Herbert's bizarre behavior, Juliana would take the kids to Herbert's mother's house, which was about two to three hours away in a place called Lake Wawasee. She would find herself doing this more and more often. While Juliana could tell something was going on with Herbert, she had no idea the full extent of what he was truly up to. In 1994, the Baumeister's son, Eric, who was now 13, was playing in the woods behind their house, and upon playing around in the woods a little bit, he stumbled across a partially buried skeleton. Eric would then run inside and inform Juliana about this skeleton he found out back. Juliana would then relay this information to Herbert, who claimed that he had found it while cleaning out the garage, and that previously it had been a specimen of his father's while he was an anesthesiologist and that he had buried it after finding it. Juliana would end up believing this story for now. While Juliana was one piece of the puzzle that eventually brought Herbert's crimes to light, the most important piece would come next. One of the victims of Herbert Baumeister was a man named Roger Goodlett. In the early stages of the police investigations, the victims were treated as missing people, with posters plastered in various locations around town. A man named Tony Harris noticed a man inside of the 501 Club looking at the missing poster of Roger Goodlett with extreme interest for minutes at a time. Tony Harris was good friends with Roger and so he approached this man, wondering why he was so interested in this poster. The man introduced himself as Brian Smart and evaded questions regarding Roger when asked by Tony. The two would talk and Brian Smart, who as we know was really her Baumeister, invited Tony back to the house using an aforementioned strategy of pretending to be a groundskeeper for the house while saying, let's have a cocktail and a swim. Although very suspicious, Tony wanted to find out if this really was the guy that murdered his friend. 
Upon arriving at the house, Tony took note of the mannequins, and upon Herbert noticing his reaction, Herbert said, I get very lonely, and the mannequins keep me company. After some convincing, Herbert had Tony choke him with a garden hose while he got off. Tony internally did not want to do this, but he also wanted to find out if this guy was truly responsible for murdering his friend Roger. When the roles were reversed, Herbert began choking Tony with the garden hose, but did so much harder and kept going. Feeling that he was going to die if he didn't do something, Tony feigned passing out. Upon Upon Herbert thinking that he had successfully killed Tony, let go of him. Tony would then open his eyes and start laughing in an attempt to not draw suspicion to himself. Herbert would seem frightened when Tony had awakened as Tony was a much larger man than him and would potentially give him trouble in a fight on even terms. Therefore, eventually Herbert would simply give Tony a ride back into town and Tony would be the only person to escape Herbert Baumeister's clutches and live to tell about it. Tony would then call a private investigator known as Virgil Vandegrift who had been looking into the crimes with this information. Although the investigation wouldn't move much as they didn't have a whole lot to go off of as Tony could not remember the exact name of the farm or where it was located given the darkness of the night. And the name Brian Smart did not return much of anything given it was a fake name used by Baumeister. Luckily, while Tony was visiting another gay bar known as the Varsity Lounge on August 29th, 1995, he saw Brian Smart walk through the doors. He talked nonchalantly with him and took note of his vehicle's license plate number in the process, which he then passed on to Vandegriff and the authorities. This key information right here would be the catalyst to Herbert Baumeister's downfall. The plate came back to a Herbert R. Baumeister of Westfield, Indiana, living at Fox Hollow Farm. The house matched Tony's description he gave in his story to Vandegrift. As a result, police approached Herb Baumeister and told him he was the suspect of the disappearances of many young men in the area, and as a result, they wanted to search his home. Herbert then refused, causing authorities to go to Juliana, who also refused. Herbert is said to have told Juliana that he was being wrongfully accused of theft and to not authorize a search of the property under any circumstances. It wasn't until June of 1996, just six months later, that Julie would authorize the search. Herbert's mental state had deteriorated even further upon losing his contract with the Children's Bureau, the children's charity his business worked with, as well as the ongoing police investigation. Within this six-month span, Herbert and Juliana had both filed for divorce proceedings. Juliana began rethinking the skeleton that her son found in 1994, the suspicious activity, and Herbert's ever increasing increasing erratic behavior, and okayed the search. On June 23rd, she called her lawyer and told him to get in touch with Mary Wilson, one of the detectives who requested a search of the property. Juliana knew that they would have plenty of time to search the property as Herbert had gone with their son Eric out of town. He was on vacation and as a result would not be back in town for the next few days. Mary Wilson arrived the next day with two county officials. They would walk up to Mary and her lawyer with gravel and rocks crunching underneath them the whole way. Juliana led the officials to where her son had found that skeleton just two years earlier. The officials began observing the lawn and kicking at areas of the grass, and one of the first areas that got moved, a bone popped out that was nearly a foot long, charred on the edges. They then began observing their surroundings more closely and realized that the gravel they stepped on while walking out toward the lawn was made up of bone fragments and even human teeth. The nearby rocks and pebbles strewn about where the kids played were all bone fragments as well. They sent these bones to the University of Indiana to be tested, and the result came swiftly. They said, these are recent, they've been burnt, and they've been buried, and they're human. Police returned the next day with much, much bigger numbers in order to help them search for bones. Upon finding a bone, an investigator would put a red flag down. In just 30 minutes, over 100 of these flags were scattered across the Fox Hollow Farm property. The number of volunteers grew as the scene progressed, with 60 volunteers quickly coming forward to help uncover the human remains. After only the first few days, hundreds of bones, teeth, and bone fragments were recovered. Upon digging up these bones, police and volunteers would also uncover many pairs of handcuffs used to restrain his victims, as well as a plethora of Miller Genuine Draft Cans. Herbert's favorite drink, buried alongside these bodies. In the meantime, worried for her son Eric's safety, who was currently with Baumeister, Juliana and her lawyer drafted up custody papers which were then sent to Herbert, and she was able to receive her son Eric back safely without Herbert knowing that his secret was uncovered back at Fox Hollow Farm. After an arrest warrant was issued, Herbert became aware of the police findings back at Fox Hollow Farm. As a result, he drove into Pinery Park, located in Ontario, Canada. It's here that he would decide to take his own life. He would write a three-page suicide letter attributing his death to his failing marriage and failing businesses, not mentioning the bodies or victims one time. According to Canadian officials, the last line on page three stated he was going to eat a peanut butter sandwich, his favorite snack, and go to sleep. 
After writing this note, he would end his own life via gunshot to the head, avoiding any punishment that was to come his way, robbing the victim's families of justice, and taking the knowledge of who his unidentified victims were to the grave with him. You see, 11 victims were tied to the remains found on Fox Hollow Farm, with 8 of them eventually being identified. The 8 identified victims were Alan Wayne Browsard, age 28, 20-year-old Johnny Bayer, 33-year-old Roger Goodlett, 20-year-old Richard Hamilton, 26-year-old Stephen Hale, 31-year-old Jeff Jones, 46-year-old Michael Kern, and 31-year-old Manuel Resendez. Authorities also say that the number of victims killed on the property could be up to 25 based on remains found at Fox Hollow Farm. But with the inability to identify all of the remains, this has not been entirely proven. By the end of the initial searches, the number of bones and bone fragments now number above 10,000. In the early 2000s, 10 acres of the Fox Hollow property along with the house itself were put on the market for 2.8 million. However, due to the gruesome acts that occurred on Fox Hollow farm, nobody wanted to pay $2.8 million for it. It was snatched up by a couple, Robert and Vicki Graves, for $987,000. I'm mainly mentioning this due to the fact that Robert and Vicki Graves still find bones on their property to this day. They then send them to the Indiana University to go alongside the 10,000 other bones and bone fragments to be identified. In early December of 2022, new searches went underway on the Fox Hollow property, mainly with the hopes that advancements in DNA testing could help identify more victims. Authorities have also asked individuals that had male family members go missing between 1980 and mid-1990 to come forward and submit DNA swabs. As of this video, a little over 20 people have come forward and submitted cheek swabs with the hope of finding out what happened to their family members. Since the new searches have been ongoing, many more bones and bone fragments have been unearthed, with potentially many more to go. I really hope the families get the positive identification they need to get some semblance of closure. That's about all I have for y'all. I do these cases one to two times weekly, so if you feel like I've earned your subscription or you enjoyed the video, you can go ahead and do that down below. Also, liking and commenting helps out a lot, as this is a small channel and it can use all the help it can get. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed. Peace.